reproduce. But that's the artist conch because the pores are actually white, but the spores are brown. So if you scratch it, it makes a brown line. So um, in, the, in the northern part of the United States, you'll see some of these in tourist shops sometimes. They knock them off the trees, and then they draw a nice picture of a deer in the forest in there, and they sell them at the tourist shop. <laughs> OK, I'm from Minnesota, and that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it's called the artist cop. But if you see one, you see them a lot of times off Brazilian pepper around here. Um, I wouldn't park under that tree in a, in a, in a store if I were you, you know, especially on the, the windward side. <laughs> because that means that the, the center core of the tree, and it can live for years just fine, you won't see symptoms. But one day, that tree is going to get weak enough and it's going to snap off. Mm -hmm. So just, just be aware of that. I do a lot of that for county properties. Sometimes I looked at a tree just the other week up at a county park in, it was Fallbrook. And um, they had done all kinds of things to it and cut the roots. And you know it was surrounded by asphalt and a parking lot and everything on all sides. And it was a giant monster eucalyptus. But how long is that thing going to really live with no roots? You know, it, I, you know, I said, it was already dying back and things. I said, guys, you know, just for personal safety, for because we have to put the welfare of the people first. And um, it's a beautiful old tree. It's, in this case, it wasn't diseased yet, but there's no roots left. And, and when it tries to grow roots, you've got somebody driving over them with, and because it's in this big parking lot and it's surrounded on all sides by asphalt. If I were you, before it fell on somebody, I'd take it out. But it's, a, it's an evaluation that you have to do sometimes. But anyway, so heart rot things, foliar diseases, um, you've got leaf spots and blights, powdery mildews, which are fairly easy to diagnose because the reproductive structure, again, of the fungus is on the outside of the plant. It pushes it outside so it can spread its spores around. And um, when it's powdery, and rusts, another one, when it's powdery like that, how do you think the spores get spread around? Wind. wind. They'll blow in wind. Yeah. Other, other fungi, like the anthracnose fungi, it makes spores, and they're on the leaf in a gooey mass. They make a gelatin-like stuff that they stick with. How do you suppose those spores get around? Yeah. Insects. Insects, water, they'll splash in, in rain if we ever get any. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Yes? Same cutter oh. somewhere else, and, and I don't know. And then he hacks something off, and I've got yep. it on that plant, right? Yep, yep. And they spread um, insects that way too. You know, they put all their stuff from one house in the back of their truck. They drive to the next house. The insects hop off, and we've had lots of exotic things that got spread around the county really fast that way. That remember that palm tree earlier that we saw that was dying back the whole big Phoenix canariensis. That is how it got spread throughout the county. It was found, that disease was found in, in San Diego County, out in Borrego first ever in the United States. And how it got spread now throughout all of California, <coughs> largely, is pruning tools. So, and the gas and electric crews have been really, really good at that. <laughs> will, will you bring that topic up a little bit later? I don't want to just uh, have this conversation right now, but uh, relative to pruning tools and what we as home gardeners mm -hmm. do, and, and teach others. Yep. Things. Yep. That's coming. That's coming at the end. Yeah. So, and if I don't bring it up again, and we'll and we'll talk about it. Rusts are also fairly easy to figure out and diagnose sometimes, and uh, they have amazing little scores under the microscope. So they're always fun to look at under the microscope because they're always so different. So different. This was one that got into the U.S. Uh, like 2005, 2006. Um, as you know, like a lot of nursery production has moved to Central America where labor is cheaper. And sometimes things come back from there with, with exotic things on them. Gladi all of the gladiolus rusts are exotic quarantine pests 
We don't have any native gladiolus rust. So if you've got a gladiolus with a rust on it, it's a pest of quarantine significance. And um, if I saw it in your yard, I'd rip it out. Sorry. <laughs> but that's what would happen. And in, in nurseries, we destroy it. But um, we don't go looking for it. We don't have a big survey looking for it. But gladiolus rust, oh, Santa Barbara County, right now, they've got over 600 acres of nursery with this. And they're, yeah. And it's bad. And they're trying very hard to, erect, to get it all ripped out and everything. But it's, it's causing them major headaches. Will it remain in the soil afterwards, too? For, for some time, yeah. Not, this one doesn't live there forever, but it will for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yes. <coughs> yeah, so when that, with the, if he plants gladiolus corms in that soil again next year, he'll have it again. Yeah, unless you're really, really diligent with your fungicides. You know, I mean, you could maybe avoid it, but I wouldn't take that chance if I were him. So. But yeah, they've got over 600 acres with it in Santa Barbara County right now. And they're hurting for that. So it's taking up a lot of your ag commissioner time too, because that you know the destruction has to be monitored, and we have a lot of other things to do besides <laughs> besides just dump plants. <laughs> what does Q mean? International? Um, no, Q means. Um, they haven't, yeah, it's a quarantine pest. We treat it like an A rated pest, but they don't have a lot of biological information on it yet because it's exotic here. They don't really know enough about it to give it a permanent rating like A, B, C. But um, so that's, they just give it a Q for temporary. Though so some of them will stay Q for years. <laughs> mm. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. I just wondered if, so if you discover something like that, you know and you get rid of it, can you put in a different gladiola, or you just have to go completely away from gladiolas and put something else in? Yeah, the question was, um, can you put in another gladiolus there? I would not. In this case, this one's a, I, as far as I know, there's not a lot of resistance to that particular rust out there yet, and they haven't been working on, I don't know, but I don't think they've worked on varieties very well that are resistant to rust. So this so, attacks all gladiolas at this Yes, point. and other members of the family. You know, like Watsonia, Ixia. So sometimes things will go to, so I wouldn't put those in there either. Yeah. Tricky little devils. All right, leaf spots. This is a really common one that we see in the spring if we ever get rain again. So <laughs> remember, um, this is called Entomosporium leaf spot. It's on flowering pear, it's on the Raphiolepsis. It's, you know, the, it's not doing major, major damage to the plant. But it looks ugly, and people go, what is this? And they bring it in. And in the center of each one of those little things is where all the spores are. And they are way cute little spores. So, <laughs> <laughs> they're fun. It's named Entomosporium, I guess, because someone thought it looked kind of bug-like. I think it looks like a mouse with three tails myself because there's one, two, three tails on them. But it's, it's a really distinct fungus. You can't mistake it. It's really easy to find on the plant usually. So it's just one of my fun ones. So. <laughs> okay, black spot of roses. You've, you've probably all seen these weird black spots on the roses. Um, it, it shows up when we have really damp years, and there are the spores, just very tiny little things, oval-shaped, kind of a blob. Not as exciting as the entomosporium, but you can, you can find them pretty easily. The anthracnoses are a group of diseases. <coughs> yeah, a whole bunch of different fungi cause anthracnoses, and they all have their specific hosts that they go to. Um, here's one, anthracnose of sycamore, caused by that big long name there. But again, this is not doing significant damage to the sycamore. It looks ugly. Um, you'll see there's also one on um, Asian elm, on the Chinese elm. Uh, that these are all pretty much spring diseases, but they, they look like a rapid blight, like something's mm. Really bad is going on, but they're not causing major damage to the tree. Can you spray it with a fungicide and it go away? Um, this one is easier to just leave it alone. It'll go. It, it's a disease of cool, wet conditions. 
So as soon as it starts drying up in the summertime, it goes away. So it's usually, of course, under those conditions, worse near the coast because it's you've got more fog there. So, um, but there are a lot. Anthracnose is a the name for a disease that causes this kind of blight. A lot of times, it, there's little black spots in the tissue, and that's actually the the fungus, and it's. They, because of the black spots, they named it after coal, anthracite coal, because it looked like they, they'd been sprinkled with coal due to all those little black spots. So, but it's a whole different range of fungi that go to, and each fungus has a different host, but they're commonly grouped as the anthracnoses, just like the powdery mildews and the downy mildews. Okay, here is one that Got, gets a lot of publicity, got a lot of publicity about 10 years ago when they first realized what it was. This is a disease that was introduced into California, they think the late 80s, and um, more in Northern California. And this is the disease that causes sudden oak death. The, the organism, it used to be a fungus, now they've decided it's an alga, but it's Phytophthora ramorum is the name of the organism. And all of the Phytophthoras are plant pathogens. And some of them are pretty bad. So you've got like Phytophthora infestans that causes potato late blight, that causes epidemics and wiped out potato crops and, um, in the 1850s and made a lot of people's parents move, or great great grandparents move to uh, the United States from Europe. And, <laughs> um, because some of them are very bad pathogens, and even the name says that Phytophthora, that phyto part is the, is the plant, and that PHTH part of the name is waster or destroyer. So it's literally a plant destroyer. That's, that's why it was named for that. But this particular one, Phytophthora, more, now most of the Phytophthoras are root rots. You've got Phytophthora cinnamomi and avocado causing root rot. Also an introduced pathogen. I think that one is native to New Guinea, and then somehow got all over all over around the world. Um, this one they believe, but they can't prove it yet, came from Asia, and um, it started caught, oak trees started dying up in Northern California, like Marin County and stuff. They were losing oak trees like crazy, and they were having a heck of a time to figure it out. Most of the Phytophthoras are root rots, but there are a few that are foliar pathogens, and this one is a foliar pathogen. And it's also, in that case, it's a trunk pathogen. So it gets on the, land, the spore lands on the trunk of an oak tree and kills it. Kills whatever tissue it's growing <coughs> in. So, but, the, okay. Um, but anyway, um, it has, this one has a huge host range. It eats, eats a lot of different plants. And on most of the plants, it doesn't cause any big problems. So this is um, camellia, and this is what it causes on camellia. And this is when, this is the first time we ever found it in San Diego County. That, those are the first plants where we first found it, right there, that kind of leaf edge. We're only going to find it in San Diego County on, um, usually it's on camellias, viburnums, pieris, in, pl in plants in a nursery under shade cloth that, with overhead irrigation. This is a, a disease of cool, wet conditions. And most of the time in San Diego County, we do not have that. <laughs> um, now, if you're up on the Redwood Coast, you know, with a dripping fog and rhododendrons growing, which are also susceptible, azaleas and rhododendrons growing under your beautiful redwood tree, you're in trouble. But um, down here, it's not a problem. And for number one, causes our climate. Um, number two is that we don't have the what I call the vector of it very much of it. This is Oregon Bay or California Bay laurel, um, Umbellaria. We do not have a lot of that down here. It's a it's a rare plant down here. Um, we've got regular laurel or bay trees, but we don't have this particular one. And on this plant, the the fungus I'll call it a fungus um, still gets on there and causes this little leaf fleck. I make spores like crazy. In that fleck, you'll find thousands of little spores in each little leaf fleck. But, um, and it doesn't seem to really hurt the tree. It, the tree th survives it just fine, but um, 
the plants on an oak tree and you get enough spores on the oak tree, it girdles the oak tree and kills it. So that's sun oak death. There it is again on Toyon. Causes a tip burn, a little flex on the leaves. But um, anyway, that's what it does in Marin County, in, in the northern half of the state, Monterey County and up. Um, you're, you're seeing oak, oak trees have been dying there now for like 20 years in huge, huge numbers. They've lost tens of thousands of them. And here's the symptoms on an oak tree. Now when you cut an oak tree and um, you leave it exposed to air for a little bit with a fresh cut, it's going to be red. So that red color is not the problem. What you're seeing here is this is the disease tissue where the fungus is living and then like right here. And you're going to see that black line in between the healthy tissue and the diseased tissue, that's really typical of a Phytophthora, that black line in there. And if I was going to culture it and get the organism out again, I would culture from that line. Because you don't want to culture from totally rotten, messy, you know, dead tissue, because all you're going to get are decay organisms out of it. And if you culture out of the healthy organisms, here on the healthy side, all you're going to get is junk again, too. You've got to get that edge. The edge between the diseased and the healthy tissue. So, and that's always a problem with root rots because when people bring in their their root rot plant or their whole plant and the roots are rotted, they're like, by the time they rip it out and bring it in, it's gone. It's like, okay, all the decomposition organisms have set in, and I can't find the original pathogen anymore. But um, so that's another thing just to just to think about. And um, here it is. That's like a bay laurel leaf. And these are the leaf spots, and, and all along here, all these little things are the sporangia. And then here is the single sporangia all blown up. And these are all the zoospores that come out of it. They're, they're tails, they have little tails, and they swim. So, and you can, you can just get zillions and zillions of spores. And so when you get something like that going crazy on a bay laurel leaf, making sporangia, and then all the sporangia are full of soil spores in uh, drippy water in the morning. Can you, you know, it just goes all over the place. It spreads really, really fast. This is the same thing it does to potatoes. By top, there are infestans on potatoes. It can wipe out a potato crop or a tomato. We, we certainly have, has, have seen it on our tomato fields here in the county at times. They can just, you know, in a couple of days, they can wipe things out. So... But we're fortunate that it's, it's a disease of cool, wet conditions, and we don't have that. This is, so it's, we figure it's been in the state at least 20 years, and these are the areas where it's found. Only this part of California, and then there's a little patch in Curry County, Oregon there. And it seems to be staying there. It's not really moving around. But we have a pretty big program to look for it in our nurseries constantly, because um, other places, there are, they've done maps you know, be, with the environmental conditions, and they've decided that there are parts of the Appalachians where they have big hardwood forests that this would really go crazy in. So we're working very, very hard to keep it contained where it is and not spread it. So, yes? So San Diego County, is it the oak trees that are dying here or not dying from that? Yes. They're dying from something else? Yes. Oh, okay. Yep, yep, they are not dying from sudden oak death, but when you get a call about an oak tree, people are going to say, I looked it up on the internet, and I, and I know I've got that sudden oak death thing. And um, I've had people say, you know, I know i got that sudden oak death thing on my palm trees. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I can go, number one, it doesn't go to palms. Number two, the only place, and we haven't found it since, like, 2008. I think here in the county, and we have had a big program. We have to do every nursery that ships to other parts of the country where they do not have this. We have to go out and take 40 samples of it every single year, send it off for testing. I mean, we've, we've looked and looked, it is not here. And with the few times that we have found it, and the last one was 2008, um, we've managed to eradicate it. So it's gone, it is not here. And the USDA has, has now agreed, they're changing the program as the end of March. They're saying, okay, if you've been tested several years in a row and you're clean, we accept that it's gone and you don't have to have your nursery tested every year now. They figured out enough about the biology of this organism that, okay, you're clean, it's not gonna spread, you don't have it, we're not gonna make you do all that testing. 
Not that the wheat wouldn't look, you know, if somebody said, oh, I have my camellia under shade cloth and I irrigate it overhead three times a week, you know, and they do what, what do they, what do you think some of these symptoms are? I, I would by all means get it tested. But um, it's not here, it's not going to establish in our environment. It looks like it's in the Channel Islands, so. Uh, no, I don't think it is. Okay. No. It's just, yeah, a facet of the color. It's, it okay. stops at Monterey County. It's Monterey County and north. And we don't know why. No one's ever found it in Del Norte County yet. I, yeah, I don't know why, but they've looked. It's, they haven't found it there yet. So it's just these areas. But it is killing thousands of trees in those counties. Um, and here's where our oak trees live. And now, okay, now we're getting into what's called killing our oak trees. We are losing oak trees. It looks just like this. When we got sudden oak death and everybody started calling about there, I was going out there looking. I thought we had this disease in the county. And I was even taking Petri plates. I couldn't get it. I couldn't get it. And I was taking Petri plates even out to the field and trying plating out in the field, thinking that the samples I was taking were drying out enough by the time I got them to the lab that I was missing it. And I just was not getting it. Um, so anyway, this is our oak mortality in the county. Of course, the darker colors are the highest mortality. This is the spread of this pest, another invasive pest in the county. But it's this. this these little guys right here, that's called the gold-spotted oak borer. Yeah, came in on firewood, they think, from either Arizona or Mexico, where those oak trees are a little different and they're more resistant to it, but ours have never been exposed to a, to a pest like this, and they're having a really great time, just like when the glossy wing sharpshooter was introduced into Tahiti. They're just having a great time munching their way through our trees. So, and you're going to hear more about this when you get your entomology section. Yes? So, oh, maybe you just answered it. The borers, uh, mm -hmm. that's entomology, not pathology. Right. Right. And manzanitas with holes in their bark, and I have three months of dendrites with little boar type things. It wouldn't be this one. No, it wouldn't be the gold spotted oak because that pretty much only goes to oaks. But there are a lot of different borers out there. Okay. So, so that's the Right. And you can't tell which borer it is just by the hole. You have to have the insect because there's a lot of little brown beetles that make holes. And, um, there's, but we're getting more and more of them because they're um, coming in on wood packing material from Asia in particular. You know that stuff we buy from China, the manufactured in China? It's, you know, it gets here in those big storage bay, you know, boxes on the ships and they're all packed on pallets. And of course all those wooden pallets are supposed to be fumigated if, you know, so that they are not carrying wood boring beetles with them. But um, we're finding out that the fumigation certificates coming from China aren't really worth the paper they're printed on. So, so we are getting um, a lot of new things on their way. We've got the Polifica shot hole borer in California now. Um, in San Diego County, that appears to have come from Taiwan. Um, we've got laurel wilt with a, another beetle from Asia on its way here. Not here yet again, but that kills avocado trees. It's, um, yeah, we're, we're having a really good time with all the Asian beetles right now. <laughs> but anyway, there's the little gold-spotted oak bar. It's got those gold spots on it. It's a, it's a very small beetle. Makes a D-shaped exit hole in the oak wood. And um, there's lots of information out there about it. So it's called gsob.org. It's the website, G-S-O-B, for gold-spotted oak bar. And um, that is what's killing our oak trees here. It's not sudden oak death, though they might find that on the internet first and call you all excited about it. It probably is not. All right, powdery mildews, another group of, of fungi. Um, poinsettia is another one that never used to, I used to work for the poinsettia king back in the 70s, we won't talk, but <laughs> that was a long time, but we didn't have problems like this then. And now it's another important thing. I always know summer has officially arrived when I get start getting all the freight myrtles with powdery mildew on them in the lab. It's you know it's pretty easy to diagnose because it's making its fruiting bodies again on the outside of the plant. All that white fuzzy stuff is spores. 
spores, spores, spores. The, the body of the fungus is living inside the cell and sucking the food out of the cell, and then it's pushing its spores up out of the plant tissue. Yeah? Can you guys talk about treatment? Um, treatment, I'm going to leave for right now. Yeah, we'll get into it at the end. There are fungicides you can use. Again, altering the environment might help. You know, if you've got things where it's very moist and humid, you might want to change your environment. You know, like if it's if it's a really shady spot and you always get mildew. Like you see that on Mandina a lot. Mandinas that aren't getting enough sun and not enough air, they all have powdery mildew. Does okay. overhead watering make it worse? No, overhead watering does not affect the powdery mildew so much. It actually free water actually kills powdery mildew spores. So, um, but it does thrive in high humidity. It likes humidity, but it doesn't like free water on it all the time. So, but if you put free water on leaves all the time, then you get other leaf spots. So. <laughs> um, resistant varieties, when you can get them, are the best way to go. So, you know, your mildew resistant roses and things like that. So, there's powdery mildew on sycamore. And you can see the plants right out here. <laughs> there's sycamore trees on this complex with it. Right there. Um, again, on a, on a big tree like this, they're not doing major damage, and it's probably not worth bothering to spray them. So oak trees get a powdery mildew. This will be on the in spring, in the spring, on the new growth of the oak trees when it's pushing out. And it's light colored because it's covered with spores. It's kind of fuzzy looking, covered with spores. And um, this one also distorts the tissue. Really makes the, the leaves are stunted and distorted. The whole shoot is distorted. But um, Spherotheca linestris is the name of that fungus. The linestris comes from lamé wool, and so because it looks fuzzy and woolly, like lamb's wool. So um, again, this is a, a, on a big oak tree. It's not hurting anything. On a l real little oak tree, you might want to think about spraying it. But on a big oak tree. You know, don't worry about it. Um, I wouldn't, at this stage, I wouldn't even cut it off because you're just going to spread the spores around even more. Mm -hmm. You can cut it off, but um, you're going to spread all that powder around so while the tree's putting out new growth, because that's what in, it's infecting, I wouldn't cut it off at this stage. Okay, the rusts. Um, rusts are plant pathogens that have, you know, plagued people as long as people have been <coughs> cultivating plants. The ancient Romans had a god called Robigo, <laughs> or Robigus, and they had a festival called the Robigalia to keep the rust off their wheat crop. So they sacrificed red-colored animals to, to the rust god so that their wheat crop wouldn't be destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> so, Robinus, the rust god, anyway, and so, um, and they had a festival called the Robigalia, which, you know, some crazy plant pathology graduate students every once in a while try to, you know, reenact just for the heck of it. It always involves a lot of drinking. I don't know why. I'm sure the Romans didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, sacrifice something red. <laughs> anyway, rusts are pretty common. There's just about a rust for every plant. There are many, many different kinds of them, but they're fairly easy to at least recognize that you've got a rust. Which rust it is is another whole matter. But you can say it's a rust, and you treat them pretty much all the same. Get a, get a resistant plant if you can, a resistant variety. Change the environment so that it's not as humid. Gets you know so you get more sun, more light, more air movement in there, and or spray, or just live with it. Or sometimes also removing the infected plant material will help. Again, these are dry spores that will move by wind when they want. So even even geranium rust is is um, invasive. It got here I think in the 60s or 70s. It wasn't for here originally either. But on the upper side of the leaf, you'll often see yellow spots, circular spots. Remember how fungi tend to grow in circles coming out. And then on the bottom side of the leaf is the actual fruiting body, the actual spores of the fungus popping right out of the tissue. It just makes a blister and pushes right through it. <laughs> So there's lots and lots of rusts out there. Daylily rust, another one that got here in the early 2000s. 
again coming in from Central America, and that moved through the hobby trade all over the place because everybody wants the newest, latest variety of daylily, and um, some of those weren't such a good idea. <laughs> so do you get rid of them, or do you? Or you can live with it, or you can get a resistant variety. Yeah, that's. Um, if you cut it off, you kind of spread the spores around. <laughs> so, um, sunflower rust, here's another one. Um, that's mint, and obviously if you were growing that to sell, or you really wouldn't want to use that in your mint julep, probably. Uh, it's not very pretty, <laughs> but um, this one is Puccinia sidii, also called um, sort of guava rust, eucalyptus rust. It has no formal name yet. This one's also invasive, really new. Um, it's native to Brazil, to Central and South America, pretty much. They first noticed it, where it lives on weedy plants, native plants down there, and doesn't really cause a problem. But um, they first noticed that in, in Brazil they planted whole plantations of eucalyptus trees for paper, for paper pulp. And um, all of a sudden they were losing their eucalyptus plantations. They were having trees going down. This rust had jumped from the native little um, Myrtaceae, plants in the Myrtaceae in the jungles onto their eucalyptus plantations. And then it started spreading. And it got into Hawaii, and um, they have a native ahia plant, ohia, ohia plant in um, that's also in the same plant family as eucalyptus, and um, it's wiped out hillsides and hillsides of the ohia plant, which is the Metro Severus in um, Hawaii, just causing real ecological ha havoc. Here our environment isn't as conducive to a rust, it's not got all that nice humidity and warmth and rain that we have, but um, it keeps jump wherever it's introduced, it's changing, it's adapting to more hosts. It comes in on one particular host at first, and it might have been guava, uh, might have been, that's Eugenia, but other things in that family, and then it seems to adapt and go to other plants in that plant family. Yeah. So we haven't seen them on our eucalyptus yet, but yeah. Um, your frequent recommendation is to grow a resistant variety. So if we want to give the public that information, is there a website of resistant varieties of? You know, not that I know of. Not rest? yeah. Um, How do you find the resistant varieties? That's I don't know for sure. You know, with roses, there are rose people out there that know, yeah, and the nurseries nurse. tend to know. Oh, so maybe the nursery men. Yeah. But some of these things, like this guava rust thing, is there There are no known you know, resistant varieties. So with some variety. plants, it sounds like there's naturally occurring resistant yes. species. Right. You can do it for the daylily. There are rust resistant. And sometimes if you just Google them, you know, rust on daylily, they'll come up with the cultivars that are resistant. But yes. Does it only happen on leaves? Or can it be on fruit and flowers? Yes. Too? The question was, does it only happen on leaves? Yes. It can be on fruit and flowers, um, sometimes stems. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've spoken of spraying. For the home gardeners, are there more than one different kind of fungicide, or is there a single fungicide that they do? No, you're, you're going to have to. Um, fungicides are tailored pretty much because the fungi is a, it's a huge kingdom. And they're very diverse. So it, the fungicides are tailored pretty much towards different groups of fungi because the rusts are basidiomycetes. You're going to need a different fungicide than you would for like a Phytophthora. Completely different. So you've got to read the label and see that it says for use to control rust. And hopefully, you know, rust on you know the, the host plant that you're talking about too. So, yes. Speaking of which, going back to powdery mildew, do some of, do the home remedies work? The baking soda, the milk, the some know, of them actually do work. The, yes. So it depends on the variety of milk. Right, and how milk. often you use it, and okay. your environmental conditions too. Because if you've got an environment that's really, really conducive to a disease, no matter what you spray, it isn't really going to work. If you but if you alter the environment too, like if it's too shady, lace out you know the tree that's shading it, or Alter your watering schedule, um, things about, like that. What about preemptive spraying, like for rust or mildew? I mean, 
I've kind of started doing that with my squash because I know I'm going to get it, and I just start right. You know, once they establish, I start spraying. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, the pesticide. Yeah. The question was is, about preemptive spraying. Yeah. yeah. If you're doing going something like grapes or cucurbits, you know they're going to get it. There isn't really resistance out there. You know, you just plan on spraying them. Yeah, I would anyway if I really wanted them. Mm -hmm. So to me, it sounds like we have to reevaluate because um, not only the environmental conditions, but I, I, I personally think that we've got some true microclimates here in San Diego. Absolutely, County. yeah. And I, you know, I, I live in Acadia, so I've really witnessed some changes over the last 10, 15, 20 years that we've lived there. So that means, you know, the plants that I choose. I'm going to choose something different than I did 20 years ago or 15 years mm -hmm. ago or even yeah. five because of how the climate is changing. Mm -hmm. I know. It's, it's, it's challenging, isn't it? It's challenging, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But fun. Yeah. Going, you know, going back to natives, maybe, you know, that are already adapted to the climate. I, but. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see a lot of gardening changes. We're gonna see a lot of changes. Period. You can see them within in our life. You can see them in our communities too. Yeah. Like you know, <coughs> the county, or yes, the local um, cities are beginning to plant. They're, you don't see roses anymore. You see succulents everywhere. That's to me, that's a sign that we have really paid attention to some of these micro changes that we're starting to see. Yeah, and to save water. If nothing else, as the water bills go up and up too, people are are trying to do something to save water too. So. Okay, all right. So, Russ, um, relatively easy to at least say you've got a rust. Now, which rust it is is a little more work. And a few of them are real quarantine pests. This is um, chrysanthemum white rust. Now, there's a brown rust on chrysanthemum that's C rated, common, we don't worry about it, um, as, at least from a regulatory standpoint. Now, if you get this chrysanthemum white rust, that's a different story, and we, have, we haven't had it for many years now, but we have had it in nurseries in San Diego County um, several times, and this is what happens to your crop when we get it. It's always been on cut flower mums, mums intended for cut flowers, but if that had been their Valentine's Day or their Mother's Day crop, you know, that can tip them over and put them out of business. It's a disease that typically shows up in the winter, kind of from November to January, because this one likes to get cool, wet conditions. And it's spread. This one is kind of a gooey rust. It's not a powdery rust. So it tends to be spread more by water. Like in a, in a greenhouse, they can, it can really get going. A nice, closed, cool, damp greenhouse. But that's what we have had to do a couple times to, for people's nursery stock. You know, we don't like doing that, but it's a federal quarantine pest. It, we, if we either do it or the feds are going to come in and do it. So that's <laughs> some of these things are designed to protect the, you know, the overall industry in the United States or the overall industry in California and your little corner is less important to them than the big picture. So but that, that's, a, that's a really bad one. We've had it a few times, but fortunately not recently. But it makes, the spores are really pretty. They're, they're like crystal, they look like little crystal vases under the microscope. So we'll talk about, rusts have really complicated life cycles, sometimes with more than one host, and um, five different spore stages. Um, so most of the time you'll only see a couple different spore stages. This is rose rust. This is the repre or the multiplying stage. That's that orange stuff that you see on the backs of the of the rose leaves. That's these are the spores. They're orange colored, and then towards this time of year, you'll see a black edge sometimes on that orange pustule, and that's is going to the teleospore stage. This guy reproduces. It just lands on a leaf and starts a new pustule over and over and over again as many times as it can. This guy's kind of the overwintering or oversummering stage, and this is where the reproductive structures are. When it when it recombines sexually, recombines its DNA, that's what happens in as this stage will finally come out and, and germinate. It'll do that in that particular stage. So you only see that you don't see that stage all the time. Um, same with this one's Puccinia hemerocalidus. This is the um, daylily rust, 
Here's the urea spores, the repeating stage, those, ye those golden yellow pustules on your daylily, and these are the, the two-celled teleospores here that it's starting to make right now, this time of year, too. It's starting to kind of go dormant or something, so it's, it's making those spores. Um, when, you talk, when you're a plant pathologist and you're talking about the rust belt, you're not talking about tr um, cars <laughs> rusting away in Detroit. <laughs> You're, you're talking about how, spore, how rust spores move around. This pathway is for wheat rust in, in North America. It starts this time of year down in Mexico when they plant their wheat. Okay. And um, then it blows up as, as, you know, through Texas, through the Midwest, and all the way into Canada as the wheat crop matures during the year. That's the rust belt for the wheat crop. Um, this is the rust belt for um, soybean rust right here. It again comes up from Mexico or the Caribbean and blows up. Um, it first got here on a hurricane. This is an invasive um, disease from India again, or no, Asia. And um, so this one blows in every year and they control it. They actually have in, in St. Paul, Minnesota, they have a rust, a serial rust lab that tries to control it the way the CDC does flu viruses. They, they look at the different rust strains that are in Mexico on the wheat crop every year and they go okay it's this one and this one and this one and they recommend to farmers to plant resistant varieties for what's going on down in Mexico before it blows up and gets here and say okay you know we've got strain XYZ of rust happening this year so plant these varieties of wheat to protect yourself and they've been very very successful they they're really good at it because when was the last time you heard of a bread shortage because rust took out the wheat crop it, yeah it doesn't happen really anymore but it takes a lot of work to do that and you don't even know what's happening there but that's the rust belt in the united states okay control measures i always say if you start with the right plant in the right place um, you know, if you've got a lawn and you want to water it three times a week, do not put cactus in there. <laughs> you know, I, I've seen so many people say, okay, we went to a Mediterranean garden, but they still left the irrigation system on the same timers and everything as for their own stuff. And um, so if you get the right plant in the right place, you, often you avoid a lot of these, a lot of problems. Um, Cultural methods, again, don't overwater, don't over fertilize, proper pruning um, in, in your vegetable garden, say rotation to avoid those nematodes. Um, keep pests out where you can, that's pest exclusion. Resistant varieties, and then, you know, as your, as your last resort, uh, with some things like powder, those darn powdery mildews on cucurbits and on your, you can't grow grapes without controlling the powdery mildew and actually get a decent crop. So some things you just have to control them, but you can use organic methods. You know, sulfur is organic. There are certain things out there that, you know, are organic and will work, though they may take, you have, may have to reapply them more often. Um, I think of, uh, remember our plant disease triangle with the host pathogen and environment? What I really think of it as, it's not a silly triangle, it's a balance. Um, your hosts are always out there and your plants are always out there and then all these little weights are your water, your fertilizer, your air movement, um, your resistant varieties, what you plant next to each other so that you don't have, you know, diseases coming in from a weed going on to your garden, things like that. So you, you want to place your weights on the right side to, to tip the environment towards the host or the pathogen. You know, it's kind of your choice in, a, in some ways. Some of these new, you know, new invasive things for which we have no, I, no information about, you can't help it. Um, but in your, in your yard and garden, you can try to tip it, host or pathogen. And um, so try to wait it on the host side. Make, <laughs> make your plant as happy as you can in the first place. Don't over fertilize it so it's got lots of really lush growth that invites a pest in. It says, ooh, look at that nice lush growth. What a nice snack. And that's where we go. And that's pretty much what I've got to tell you. So, more Thank questions? You.
Yeah. Almost every year my zucchini plants and my squash plants to get some kind of a something on the leaves, like some kind of fungus, I think. Now, is that because the spores stay in the soil, or is that because I just continue to use bad cultural? Or they're, they're blowing in from your neighbor who didn't do anything either and who left, you know, left the plants there for last year and there's still some powdery mildew growing on them. I, you know, I would guess it's powdery mildew because so it's really common on them. So what would I spray them with because they're already getting zucchini. It's like mid-season usually when it happens. They've already gotten zucchini and it's already had some fruit time. Yeah, that's when you go to the store and read the labels. <laughs> I'm sorry, but, or, and, or Google, powder, you know, or check out powdery mildew on the UCITM things, and they usually have a list of fungicides there. So, um, yeah. Do you need to see the roots to diagnose a root problem? To, yes. To di the question is, do I need to see the roots to diagnose a root problem? Yes. And just yeah. look at the leaf. You know, <laughs> now it could be anything making yeah. that leaf yellow, you know, it could be overwater, it could be anything, so. Or, okay, more questions. Yeah. You partially answered the question, but when you go to a big box store, mm -hmm. many of the uh, remedies are multi-purpose. Right. If you look for one that's specific, as specific as you can to your particular problem, or buy one that's more multi-purpose It depends on how many problems you have. Because <laughs> I, well, I know like the rose sprays, they have an insecticide, a lot of them have an insecticide and a fungicide in there. And um, if you have both of those pests, uh, yeah, I would use the all-in-one, all-purpose thing. So it all, it all depends on what pest I've got going on. It's kind of parallel to uh, uh, medicine for, for colds, I say. Have a leaky nose or a soft yeah, something. Yeah, or a cough or yeah. But better off to find that it's more specific to the specific problem you have. If you can do that, you can Yes. Yeah, because you may not need that insecticide. If you've got rose rust, you, you don't need the insecticide there unless you've also got aphids on top of it. But those you can walk off, you know, brush off with water from your hose. So. It kind of depends on what you've got. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, um, getting back to my previous question, how about sterilization of our tools? And, and yeah, um, is there a material that. available that we can find and, and then and teach others what to do? The hospital disinfectants work. But, um, and again, it kind of depends on what it is. Some of those viruses, like, yeah, 10% bleach uh -huh. okay. will work, but it's hard on your tools. Yes. I worked um, with the gal that runs the nursery at Bellevue Park, and she she gets those little uh, blowers. It's like a blowtorch thing, and between each, and that kills everything. A lot, of the, a lot of the palm guys are doing that, yeah. that to prevent the transmission of the fusarium wilt from palm to palm. They burn the saw off because you can't properly sterilize a, a chainsaw. You know, because the easiest way, of course, to trim your palm tree is to use a chainsaw. But then, if you if you were doing a diseased tree, the next tree you go to, you inoculate it. So and it's good with drying your clothes too. You don't have to worry about them rusting because you're yeah. drying them yeah. as well. As but it's dangerous. It's a little dangerous. Yeah. If you like those little torches. <laughs> yeah. But no, I'm. I'm some of the nurseries now are doing that too, but I'm like, oh, you got all these guys running around the nursery with little torches, you know. <laughs> Makes me a little nervous, but yeah, hospital disinfectant, 10% um, bleach. Um, what, about, what about the wipes, you know, the antibacterial wipes that get in there? I don't know how well they work on plant pathogens. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I know they're tested for human pathogens, but I don't know how well they work on plant pathogens. And then some things like tobacco mosaic, you know, that's tough against everything. You know, it withstands burning. So, <laughs> is that the same as tobacco rust? No, tobacco mosaic is a virus. Yeah, a little different. Right, I don't, yeah, I don't know of a rust on tobacco right off. Yeah. Yeah, could have been the mosaic. So, yeah, it's 
it's hard because each one is case specific, kind of. It's and they're they're other than things like the anthracnoses, the powdery mildews, where you are grouped. <coughs> somebody's yard and their, their tree is dying and you're going what the heck is going on so that tree's dead and you look around the yard and you see other things other plants in the yard die yeah so what would be some of the first things you think about yeah, look yeah. at look at look for chemicals, look for irrigation, look for, you know, did, did we have frost here lately or anything like that? Now in this one they, they the uh, perpetrator left oh. us a really good clue. Oh. 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 Wow. <laughs> this was a neighbor dispute. Oh. And the neighbor was one you know, one guy was mad at the other, so he went through the yard with Roundup. <gasps> When the neighbors weren't home and they didn't know, and then his stuff shows up later. Smiley face. He made a smiley face in her hawk. But now, if you had just gotten, if all they did was bring you in a little sample of like that dead grass, you couldn't tell what it was. You'd say, okay, I have some dead grass here. You need to look at the overall picture whenever you possibly can. Look at the, look at you know the other dead trees, other dead weeds, you know shrubs with similar things. Something that goes to a lot of different plants in the same location, that's not a disease. It, you know, so um, anyway, that's that was an actual case investigated by our pesticide division. <laughs> yes. Could you clarify this? Uh, is Roundup a poison or is it a disruptor? It interferes with chlorophyll sy synthesis. So, so it's not a poison, really? Real, yes, it's not really. It, okay. if, if, um, it only affects things that have chlorophyll. You know, so as long as, if you, if you depend on chlorophyll to make your food and then you can't make chlorophyll anymore, then you die. But it doesn't affect those of us who don't depend on chlorophyll <laughs> in our bodies, yeah. Okay, that's really it. <laughs>